One day, my two best friends and I decided to go to Las Vegas, Nevada. And on our way to Vegas, we got into a rollover car accident. Long story short, I get ejected, Steve gets ejected. When you fly out of a car at 80 miles an hour, you usually don't live to talk about it. Obviously, I survived that accident, but Steve didn't. Hmm. I was in the accident with him. I got ejected with him. I was lying on the pavement next to him. I got flown in the helicopter with him and I was in the operating room right next to him and they were able to save my life and they weren't able to save his. Two months later, I had just gotten out of my wheelchair on the crutches and Matt wanted to celebrate that by riding dirt bikes. And I see him climb up a hill. I start climbing the hill behind him. And when I get to the top of the hill, there is no top, it's just a huge hole. And as I was falling into that hole, I was able to reach out and grab a bush by one arm looking straight down into this dark pit. Three to four minutes later, I realized, oh my gosh, he has to be in this hole. I call 911. The police chaplain says I need to speak to the family. Now, the reason that it's taken so long is because this is the deepest mine shaft I've ever seen. It's 780 feet deep. Matt fell all the way to the bottom and didn't survive. 66 days earlier, Steve, Matt, and I were in a car accident together that only Matt and I survived. Now Matt and I fell into a mine shaft together that only I survived. So in 66 days, I lost the two most important people to me in my life other than my family in accidents that I was in. Paul. Thank you for doing this. We are really excited to bring you to Coeur d'Alene and bring you to our audience. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Stoked to be there virtually. Yeah. So yeah, man fantastic. on the mission, man. Man on the mission. We got to really consider here. We only have a little bit of time and it's going to probably take a thousand dinners with you to unpack the true nature of coal. But I want to just get right down to it. At the end of the day, I know you and I know you're on an incredible mission, right? But before we get there and before we extract all the gold, I think it's important just get right down fucking to it. We want to pull you right to the worst place in your life, right to the darkest place in your life, the time when you couldn't see any light, you couldn't see a way out. This is where we like to start the storytelling. If you don't mind opening up and unpacking that for us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the worst season for me was when I was 21 years old. Uh, I was actually a firefighter. Um, I had started working with the department at 19 years old and I had my whole life figured out. I'd put in my 30, 35 years with that department, retire with full benefits, pension, you know the deal. And that was my goal. Well, one day my two best friends and I decided to go to Las Vegas, Nevada. I live in Orange County, California. So that's a mm. quick four hour drive through the desert. And on our way to Vegas, we got into a rollover car accident. I was not the driver, I was a passenger. My best friend in the world, Steve was driving. My other wow. best friend, Matt, was in the passenger seat and I was in the back seat when the mm. car started rolling. Um, Matt got super banged up and had to be rushed to the hospital in an ambulance. Mm. But Steve and I both got ejected out of the car. As it was flipping down the freeway, uh, the witnesses and the police estimated that we were going about 80 miles an hour when we started to roll. The speed limit out there is like 70, I think, 75. So we weren't being reckless. Um, some We were in somebody's blind spot and they didn't see us and they merged into our car, which caused us to flip end over end. Long story short, I get ejected. Steve gets ejected. I am I'm have massive trauma. And they shut the freeway down in both directions and actually landed a helicopter right there on the freeway and loaded both Steve and I into the helicopter to air flight us to the hospital because we would not have survived in an ambulance. We were out in the middle of the desert, about a 30-minute drive from the nearest hospital, and wow. we wouldn't have survived. I had a traumatic brain injury. I was bleeding out of my eyes, my, my nose, my ears. Um, and I lost a lot of skin. I, you know, I was broken everywhere. I, when you fly out of a car at 80 miles an hour, you usually don't live to talk about it. And so mm. I get to the hospital, they're operating on me. They're operating on Steve. Uh, long story short, obviously I survived that accident, but Steve didn't. Mm. And at 21 years old, he was the most important person to me in my life other than my like own family, right? He was my best wow. friend. He was my boy that I had grown up with. And so I had so much grief from losing him, but I had soul crushing guilt because I was in the accident with him. I got ejected with him. I was lying on the pavement next to him. I got flown in the helicopter with him and I was in the operating room right next to him as the team was working on me and the team was working on him and they were able to save my life and they weren't able to save his. Mm -hmm. And um, it rocked me, bro. And Matt, the other survivor of the accident, he and I became inseparable because we understood what it felt like to lose Steve together and to now be have the questions and the guilt of why were there three of us and now there's just two of us. Wow. And I was so hurt, I had to move back into my parents' house. So I'm 21 years old working as a firefighter at this point. 
Um, my career in firefighting was instantly over. I was in a wheelchair. Hmm. I didn't say that part. I had a spinal contusion um, in my L4, L5 of my spine. So my waist down was temporarily paralyzed and I had to. So I had to move back into my parents' house immediately after that accident because I had to be completely cared for. Like I couldn't even feed myself for the for the weeks following the accident. And um, so back home with hmm. mom and dad. Well, Matt having survived that accident with me, like I said, we became inseparable. So he would come over to my parents' house where I was now living every single day to literally like carry me to the toilet when I needed to go and to like order me food because there wasn't Uber Eats back then and feed me and just, you know, keep me alive uh, wow. and, and try to yeah. pull me out of my depression. And about two months later, I had just gotten out of my wheelchair onto crutches and Matt wanted to celebrate that by riding dirt bikes. And I was like, dude, you're crazy. We can't because dirt biking was something that Matt and I loved doing together. And he's like, bro, you can sit on a dirt bike. I know you've got weak legs, but I'll help you. Like, let's do this. He was just desperately trying to get me back into my old routines because he could see me sliding into this massive depression because of losing Steve. And again, not just the loss of my best friend, but the guilt of surviving that. And so Matt was just trying his hardest to, to mm. get me happy again. And so our parents agreed. Matt packed up his truck with our dirt bikes. We went out into the desert. Long story short, after a day of riding together, very slow. I mean, again, I had just got out of a wheelchair, so I'm putting around at 20, 30 miles an hour, not, not doing any jumps or any of that. And uh, Matt's driving. We're on our way back to our camp to pack up and go home. He's first. I'm second. I'm about 30 seconds behind him. And I see him climb up a hill and disappear at the top of the hill because when you're at the bottom of the hill, you can only see the, you know, the crest. You can't see what's on top. I start climbing the hill behind him. And when I get to the top of the hill, there is no top. It's just a huge hole. It's a 20 foot by 10 foot hole and I fell into it. And as I was falling into that hole, I was able to reach out and grab a bush oh. and just hang like Indiana Jones by one arm, looking straight down into this dark pit. And I was able to climb out and I started calling for Matt. Uh, my bike fell into the hole. So I, I started yelling for Matt. I was, I was walking around trying to find him, hoping that he had gone around the hole and just continued driving after about three or four minutes he didn't come back for me, you know, because if he had passed the hole and continued, he would have noticed I wasn't following him anymore. And he would have turned around and come back at that point, three to four minutes later, I realized, Oh my gosh, he has to be in this hole. And I didn't know how deep the hole was. It could have been 30, 40 feet deep. He could be down there with a broken leg or bleeding or who knows how hurt he was. So I start panicking. I call 911. I'm trying to explain to them in the middle of the desert where we are. It takes a little bit of time. They get out there, they set up the camp. And again, this is a long story, but we were there for seven hours while the fire department was setting up their, their rig to go down in the hole to get Matt. Wow. Seven hours into this, the police chaplain says, I need to speak to the family. So the police chaplain pulls us aside. It's Matt's mom and dad, Steve, who I had just lost two months earlier, 66 days earlier, Steve's mom and dad were there. My mom and dad were there and my youth pastor. That's surreal. And uh, wow. as we're standing there, the police chaplain says, okay, guys, this is an abandoned mine shaft. The reason there's a hole out here is because this company came and dug out all the gold and silver and just left the abandoned mine shaft. And apparently I found out later that there are 40,000 unmarked open mine shafts in the California deserts, they estimate. And so we fell into a mine shaft. Damn. It was nobody's fault. We weren't doing anything wrong. It was just a hazard that was there that was unmarked that you couldn't see until you were right on top of it. And um, so the police chaplain said, you know, the reason that it's taken so long and it's taken us seven hours to get to Matt is because this is the deepest mine shaft I've ever seen. It's 780 feet deep. Matt fell all the way to the bottom and didn't survive. And Fuck. I lost it. 66 wow. days earlier, Steve, Matt, and I were in a car accident together that only Matt and I survived. Now Matt and I fell into a mine shaft together that only I survived. So in 66 days, I lost the two most important people to me in my life wow. other than my family in accidents that I was in. You guys both right now have best friends. And if when we finish this podcast, you got a phone call that you just lost your two best friends, this would be one of the worst days of your life. But what made it what made it the, the darkest season wow. for me ever was because, again, I didn't just lose my two best friends. I survived the accidents that they didn't. So I had soul crushing survivor's guilt and it put me into a very, very, very dark place. Yeah. And uh, I had this victim mentality for, for a minute. Um, and you know what? Screw it. I'll be totally transparent. In my car accident with Steve, uh, they prescribed me morphine pills because I was so banged up and so hurt that when I was discharged from the hospital, they sent me home with, you know, 30 morphine pills. 
And I only had to take maybe a week or two's worth of medicine because the pain eventually subsided. And I just had this bottle of morphine that was in my medicine cabinet in my, in my bathroom at my parents' house. T two months later, I lose Matt. And I remembered those pills. And I said, you know what? I'm going to try something. And I would take one or two morphine pills and then drink hard alcohol. I wasn't suicidal. I wasn't trying to kill myself. But I figured out wow. that I would fall asleep at like 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And I wouldn't wake up until like 11 a.m. the next day. So I was just medicating myself. And then the few hours I was awake, I was so, you know, on morphine that I just didn't feel anything at all. My parents didn't know I was doing this. This was, you know, just something I was doing in, in their bedroom at their house because I was still recovering from my car accident. And I did that for about 30 days. So just for some dates, I lost Steve on September 10th. I lost Matt on November 14th. And then from November until December 18th was when I was, you know, doing this behavior. And I realized on December 18th that I was being a victim, that I had all the reason in the world to be depressed and to feel sad and that I was dealing with something very, very real. But being a victim taking pills and drinking alcohol was mm. no way to honor their lives. And I haven't told this story to me. It gets me a little emotional. But mm. in that moment, I looked up at heaven and I started talking to Steve and Matt. And I said, I will not let your lives have meant nothing. I will not let your story end here. And I will not let you be forgotten. Mm. I'm going to do more in my life. And I'm going to push myself farther than I ever thought possible to honor you. So that when I'm face to face with my creator, and I'm face to face with Steve and Matt again, because I believe I will see them in heaven. I want to be able to point back down on my life and say, you guys only got 21 years. For whatever reason, I was given more time. But with the extra time I had that you didn't, look at what I did with it. And that's where my mission began, was I promised Steve and Matt that I would live a life big mm -hmm. enough for the three of us because they were only given their 21 years. And so I poured the rest of my morphine down the toilet and flushed it. I stopped drinking alcohol and was sober for like the next two or three years. Didn't take a sip of alcohol, and I'm still not a big drinker to this day and changed my entire life around, found my mission, found my God-given calling, and have been pursuing it ever since. Um, but that season, it was 2004, in the fall of 2004 through much of 2005, I was just, again, in this ugly place of soul-crushing guilt and grief of losing my two best friends in accidents that I was in. Mm. Wow. Mm. One of the most powerful, profound stories I've ever heard. Um, number one, my heart just breaks for you, brother. Um, what an inspiration you are to have. Not a lot of people can go to these types of places. Just first of all, just it's just, a, it's just rare that someone has that kind of tragedy. There's so many people that play the victim card and, and you touched on it, even though you did, which I mean, I mean, of course you, you are. <laughs> That's some of those tragic, painful things that I, I could ever imagine. Um, really connecting the dots here. In that moment of just pure, uh, you trying to put yourself in his shoes. Yeah, I, I have something I want to ask you on that. Um, in my previous career as a therapist, I, I'm so touched by your story because sometimes people will wallow in grief for years thinking it's the loving thing to do. And the pivotal thing that gets them out of it is to recognize that if they really loved their lost loved one, they would dignify their life by fulfilling their own potential, like by, by making their life the most beautiful thing out of love for them. And that takes, usually that takes months and years of inner work. Right. And I'm really intrigued as a young man how you located that insight was that like a would you say that's like grace or how did that come yeah, to you um, like there is no shortage of god's grace in my life and blessings that's for sure um i always say that i've lost more than most but i've been given more than wow. most and, and to your question i realized that i was on a path of only two outcomes uh so so why it took me 30 days and by the way i should clarify on december 18th that's where i made a decision and that's where i made a choice but the pain and the grief didn't end there um i went through hell and i yeah. went through therapy my mom is a therapist yeah. and so i you know i went through a long emotional recovery and here i am mm. all these years later and i still have hard days of losing Stephen matt and dealing with what i had to go through in my 20s yeah. and so so just to be clear to your audience you know when i made that decision mm. i didn't mm. feel better 
but why I was able yeah. to come to the conclusion that the pills needed to stop, the victimhood needed to stop, and the alcohol needed to stop was because I realized I'd end up in two places. Either A, addicted to drugs and alcohol and just completely throw my life away, or B, accidentally overdose. Because my body apparently has very high tolerance for yeah. things like morphine or whatever. By just 30 days of abusing these pills, sure. I was already taking like three or four of them when I was only supposed to be taking like one every eight hours. And wow. so because I had to take more and more and more, I realized wow. I'm going to I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to accidentally fall asleep and not wake up. And I, I wasn't suicidal, but I didn't want to be alive. I didn't. I was in this in between place and it scared the hell out of me. So why I had my aha moment was I, I had so much guilt in the idea that I would accidentally kill myself when Steve and Matt were accidentally killed that for me mm. to be the only survivor and to lose my life over substance abuse was so selfish and so shallow, it scared the crap out of me and sobered mm. me up. And so I was still in the pit of despair and I still went to therapy and I still had to take a long emotional road to recovery, but I stopped the alcohol and I stopped the pills instantaneously because I started crying in my parents' room realizing that my, I, my friends were gone and now I was going to kill myself over something as stupid as medicating. And that was like the ultimate slap in their face. And it was like yeah. spitting on their graves. And so I was like, I'm done with this behavior. I'm not doing it anymore. I'm going to fire myself up. I'm going to yeah. change lives. I'm going to make millions of dollars. Like I'm going to be a badass. I'm going to do it for you boys. And that, that was the realization was, was I, I had this aha yeah, moment I that, that I was going to either waste my life or accidentally end it. And that was the ultimate slap in their faces Dude. because if I had died and they had lived one of them, so they wouldn't inspiring. have done the same thing. They would have gone off and made, you know, a, a life for themselves that mattered. And so that was my commitment to them. And that's where victimhood ended for me. Fuck, so and I inspiring. used my tragedy to fuel that, my mission. Yeah, that, that's profound mm. for you to take that kind of pain and, and that quickly turn it into this rocket fuel. I mean, so you're 21 years old you know, you're, this is a really mature thing to have happened to such a young person and to be able to rebound so quickly. There's obviously natural gifts and something that's not rare, but you know, it's like my story. I have a little bit of a connecting story. I lost my dreams coming out of high school of playing baseball. Now I didn't, it's funny, man. You think you had it hard or you think you went through some shit or you, I mean, the man, there's levels to this, man. Just when you think you've had it bad, you, I mean, you could think of a story like Cole's and it really like can realign you. But for people that are going through pain and they're going through trauma and they're going through hell, like it's real for you when you're in the moment. It feels like the worst thing on planet earth. And for me, like I had back to back major surgeries. The doctor fucked up on, on one, my junior high school, and they pinched my funny bone nerve, my owner nerve in with the joint. And I was on pain meds through that process. And it was the grief of losing out on an entire baseball season where it was the best baseball I've ever played in my life. D1 schools was like the only thing I was thinking about right at that point in my life. And all the momentum just stopped in an instance. And I killed myself to get back. And I, I first swing in batting practice, I tore my labor and rotator cuff. So I'm just trying to quickly set the scene here as I connect one of these dots. But I turned to pills because they were given to me for two years. I mean, the owner nerve, they had to stretch it out. It took about a year to stretch the nerve back out because it swelled up like a tightrope and it would send pain down to my lower yeah. back of my head. So I had valid reasons, right? But it was my sorrow and my fucking grief and the victim mentality that kept me like starting to go down this dangerous road. And I did, I didn't get out of it in 30 days like you, but I can connect at least a sense of that feeling of the, de of the destructive nature of, of, of really like using that as a crutch. Now at 21, after these, after this nightmare fucking happens to you, and I'm so sorry, this just fucking breaks my heart, but what like your testimony is, is potentially, and I know it has, cause I know you, but even in this podcast, you're reaching people like this testimony right here is actually saving lives. This has the power to really impact someone who just one person, like I always think about a drop of water, like that's one human life in, a, in an ocean. Like, was it worth it? Yeah, that's one fucking life you changed. Now imagine doing that over and over and over again. So I love how you've turned this pain in, into, into your, this progress, this testimony. Yeah. Where did you turn to at 21? So for me, it's like I, I needed a vehicle. I lost baseball, right? I didn't have anything to be obsessed about. My dreams were fucking gone. Like I'm, I'm really trying to connect the dots of, of like, how does someone turn from, from victimhood and grief? Where do they put that energy? Where does Cole put that energy where like some seeds start getting planted, some momentum starts coming back in your life? And 
Where does happiness so re- me, reaffirm itself in your life? Three things. Number one, I got mentors in my life. Um, and I call them mentors. One was my therapist, mm. which is mentorship. Mm. One was my pastor for my church because I was going yeah. through massive grief and, and he was in biblical context walking me through that. And some were business mentors. I'll get to that in a second. Um, yeah. I, little context to answer your question, I couldn't go back to firefighting for about a year. It took me a year to physically recover. And then praise God, I did have a 100% recovery. I was able to go back to firefighting if I had chosen to. But in that year of recovery, I started my first business. It was investing yeah. in real estate, flipping houses. I immediately after that accident realized that I didn't want to go back to college and get like a, a degree or something. I didn't want to go do corporate America. I, I didn't know how well I would heal physically. So we didn't know if firefighting would ever be an option. And again, it, it, I did heal, but at the time we didn't know. And so I needed to figure out how to make money all by myself. And so I started evaluating where money is. And I, and I learned pretty quickly that real estate is a very common denominator amongst the wealthy. They either make their money in real estate or they stick it in real estate if they're making it somewhere yeah. else. It was like, no matter who I, I talked to that appeared or was successful, real estate was like the only thing that they all did. So I, I leaned into that heavily. And now to answer your question, yeah, how I recovered and where I put all that energy was building my first business, which was was uh, pretty, pretty quickly successful just because I was buying and flipping houses in 2005, if you remember. 2005 real estate for any of you, you know, people that were following it then, it was booming. It was exploding very much huge, like we yeah. saw it, you know, booming, post COVID yeah. explode. And I could buy a house, count to 10 and sell it right. for a profit. So I had pretty instantaneous success. 2008 rocked me and almost bankrupt me because then you actually needed to know how to invest in real estate. You couldn't just buy any house and sell it for a profit. But I, I started doing real estate and I leaned heavily on my church. Mm. So the two places I put all my energy, is by leaning heavily into my church and them knowing that I was going through a process, they actually asked me to step up and be the youth pastor intern to work right underneath the youth pastor. And I became the worship leader at that church. So I was at the church four or five days a week in both a leadership role, a worship leader role, as well as just a, a, a you know a, an attendee sitting in the audience on Sundays. And yeah. I got to give the church credit. Uh, they leaned heavily on me and were a huge part of my healing process. So, so I put energy into the church and the kids that I was mentoring. Mm -hmm. And I learned what was pretty quick uh, was that even though I was in the role of, I was, you know, at the time now, I think I was 22 years old and these kids are all like 14 to 18. They're all high school kids that I'm mentoring. The more I poured into them, the more healing I got. And that was my first experience of that sort of reciprocation that mm -hmm. I was there to serve but yeah. undoubtedly, I was the biggest, I, I got the most yeah. gain. And so that was a huge part of my healing was I would just mentor these kids and they yeah. would go through bullying and all the stuff that high school brings. And the boys would talk to me about, you know, <laughs> wanting to, to date girls and do things that their parents were to, thought were inappropriate and you know, all that stuff. And just the more I mentored them, the more that I healed. And then that outlet of my business, the more my business grew, the more I felt accomplished and that I was doing my commitment to Steve and Matt that I would live a bold life. So I stopped the victimhood and yeah. started serving others and started working hard. And those two outlets of mm. servitude as well as hard work and business were where I put all my energy. And then I said three, the third thing was physical working out. I've always been in shape, but like I got serious about yes. working out after that because no. running and, and exercise was yeah. a great physical outlook, uh, output of like my emotional energy. I would think about Steve and Matt and like go do a workout and, and I would get it out. So physical activity, service and hard work in my business were what got me through that season. Yeah, I, I'm going to back you up for a second. Okay, so it's funny because so much of what I preach now, so much of what I pour into, it, it, it talks about the fucking three things. Yeah, Entrepreneurship is such a fucking gift. The gym, the power of endorphins, like never underestimate the power of endorphins. But this new one, this serving others, stepping into the light, like really, this is one that I'm grappling with right now and really trying to take ownership with. But I will say this, I've never, for me personally, I've never felt more fulfilling feelings in my entire life than I felt over the last three months. And it's really been stepping out in the light and, and all the fear and all the, and all the, like the discomforting thoughts, like there's no comfort when you step in the light, really like 
part of serving others is getting out of your own way, getting out of your own ego, you know, like really like putting it aside and not giving a fuck what people think because to really impact people means you got to be up in, in the limelight in a sense to really impact people. You got to be, I mean, you could do it one-on-one, but really I feel like the church sort of brought you to a place where you started realizing the power of communication and, and, and pouring into other people and this universe just opening up wonderful doors. But what a unique alignment as he's speaking, I'm like, fuck, like, Every one of those is a book. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. It's like, I think anyone, particularly Cole, those three simple things, it's almost like an antidote to a man of any age, or really a woman, let's say, man or woman. But like, I could, a 55 year old going through a big difficulty in life, if they could just retap into their faith, those three. Yeah, get their body right and, and, and have a new mountain to climb. It's amazing. I could just hear it in your voice. And I just have to add this thought. I was really moved by, like I could hear, you could sense the truth behind people's utterances. So your your commitment to, I think you said, be bold out of love for your friends. That fire, I mean, that's at the heart of your success. Like Eric introduced me to you. So I started following you a little bit, checking you out. And, And I was really curious, where did this man's spark come from? Where's this fire coming from? Yeah, I got, I've got a big chip on my shoulder and almost a debt to pay. You know, I, I was given time that others don't have. And you know, a yeah. question that I get a lot from people that hear my story and then see my success, which, you know, I, I very humbly, God has blessed my business in incredible ways over the last 20 years that I've been an entrepreneur or however long, 18 years. And um, so people say, Cole, can you like, how much of your success do you attribute to that instance? And can people who don't go through something that tragic have success? Like, cause it is my fuel. It is my motivator. And I say, absolutely. Yes. Uh, you don't need to almost die and mm-hmm. lose people that matter to you to make the decision that I made. The, the, the right. thing that I yeah. did that changed my life forever wasn't totally almost dying. The thing that I did that changed my life forever was the decision I made sitting on my bed at my parents' house on December 18th that I would stop being a victim, I would stop taking pills, I would stop drinking alcohol, and I would start serving my yes. friends by living a life that matters and big enough for the three of us. And that was a simple choice. Now, I was highly motivated in so that good. choice, but that was a simple choice that anyone can make. And then I think that three-step formula, you know, faith at my church, fitness yeah. in the gym, and then just absolute crushing business with, which by the way, business has had its ups and downs. I'm sure we'll get into that next. Um, 2008, like I said, completely almost bankrupted me. So it's not all puppy dogs and lollipops, but having an outlet to set myself up for wins. Um, you know, I, I, I jog a lot now and I hate it. I ran four miles this morning to get ready for this podcast because I, you said something about endorphins, Eric. I see it. Same thing. I've got a big Mm -hmm. day today and I knew that I needed to run and get my blood up and sweat before I could take on the day. And I hate running. But the reason that I do it is from David Goggins. Our mutual friend, Ed Milet, <laughs> introduced me to David Goggins in 2019. And he's the one that told me I needed to start running because I hated it so much that if I could if I could force myself to do the things I hated most, that I wouldn't just be getting physically fit, I'd be getting mentally fit as well. And there's something to say about oh. the struggle being good in business, that when we're facing challenges in our business and when we're physically exerting ourselves, like at the gym or jogging, putting yourself through that beyond just the endorphin release, it Mm. creates a mental resilience that then goes into all areas of life. So for anybody who wants success and doesn't want to have to almost Mm. die first, it really is about a mentality. All those accidents did was (laughs) got me thinking right and doing what Mm. I needed to do. And anybody can choose to start thinking right, prioritize your health, prioritize your business, prioritize your relationships, yeah. and to make them your 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 driving factor in your success. Yeah, scar tissue is powerful. You talked about chips on your shoulder. Chips on your shoulder, those can be powerful. The biggest thing that anyone can do is listening is to find like the dark shit in their life and to turn that into fuel, like really leverage the fuck out of it. So many people though, they the second you take extreme ownership, 
like they see a transformative like nature in their life. Everything starts changing. Universe talks to you differently. People talk to you differently. Like naturally, when you take extreme ownership, people are going to disappear out of your lives that are not good for you. Like you just had that extreme ownership position in life is fucking powerful. And that scar tissue, like you're really nothing without scar tissue. I, like the best people, have you ever noticed this? The best people can always go to these, these places where they're talking about like the journey from hell to the light. Like if you, ha if you don't have that, if you don't have a struggle in your life, like fuck, no one gives a shit. Like no one cares about yeah, success. We only care about like the struggle. How the fuck did you turn nothing into something? How did you turn pain into progress? How did you create momentum when everything was stacked against you? You had every bad thing go wrong in your life and you still found a way to turn out smelling like roses. It's fucking powerful, bro. I can't wait to really like see how this thing, because I know how, how it evolved. I mean, you're, you're a big motherfucker right now. Like this is undeniable. Like your gift to the world is, you are a gift to the world. This is fucking awesome. I can't, I'm so stoked to be having this conversation with you. I, you speak truth. You like pour it out into the universe and like the winds that are coming in your life are there, but like, take me to, take me to, oh wait, let's go. Let's, let's talk about the down in business because so everyone thinks it's this, this ride like this, who's yep. never been on it. It's yep. not. So I started a fix and flip business 2005. Uh, I got my dad to quit his job and become my partner. I was having some success and he was miserable in his career. He was overworked and underpaid in corporate America. So I was like, dad, quit your job. Come be my partner. Let's flip houses together. So he did. And the, the rest is history. We started in 2005. The economy was great. Real estate was great. We were making money hand over fist. I was 22, 23, 24 years old, making a half a million dollars a year. I was an idiot. And so I was buying wakeboard boats and Escalades and renting mansions. You know, I was had, I had no financial literacy. I had no financial <laughs> mentors at that time. I was just lucky. I was doing real estate when you couldn't lose, right? Well, 2008 mm. came, the recession came, real estate imploded, and I started losing money on deals. I would flip a house and when I would go to the closing table, instead of leaving with a check, I had to write a check because we sold the house for less than we were into it for. So I had to make up the gap. Mm. And I, I started hemorrhaging in my nice. business and you know we'd have a couple of wins here or there, yeah. but I was losing more than I was winning and I was hemorrhaging money to by the time it was 2010, I was down to like my last $30,000 to my name, which might sound like a lot of money and it is what it is, but yeah, yeah. Well, compared to what I, I was making almost six figures a month, right? <laughs> and so now I'm down to like 30 grand and my bills are like 50 grand a month, right? Because I was a stupid kid that financed everything. I figured out what leverage meant at 21 years old. So I leveraged cars and leveraged boats and leveraged everything. Huh. And it made a lot of sense if I continued to make the money I was making. But when the money went away, I didn't own it all cash. I learned my lesson. Now everything in my life, I pay cash for it. I don't care about, Nicole, that's stupid. Why would you buy a depreciating asset like a car? Because I can afford it and I don't need to think about it and I don't care, right? Sure. I could buy something else with that money, but I love cars. And, and so mm. long story short, mm. I'm, I'm getting my ass kicked financially. So I needed to make a decision. It's, it's 2010 now. It's two years of getting beat up and bloody in real estate. And I finally had enough. I told my dad, take my half of the equity. I can't do this anymore. My girlfriend at the time dumped me on Cinco de Mayo, which is so, who dumped somebody on Cinco de Mayo? So messed up, right? But she dumped me <laughs> on Cinco de Mayo. And so I said, screw it. And let me ask you boys, when your business is absolutely imploding That's and not great. profitable anymore and your girlfriend dumps you, what do you do next? Well, the obvious choice for me was move to Mexico and become a missionary, which is what I did. So I, true story, yeah, I, I told say, my dad he could yeah. have my half of the business. <laughs> That's awesome. I joined a nonprofit organization called YWAM, which stands for Youth with a Mission. I moved to Ensenada, Mexico, and I was now a full-time yeah. missionary living off my $30,000 instead of raising support. And I'm down in Mexico and I'm building houses for homeless families and I'm loving it. And while I'm down there, um, uh, so, so my role was uh, American or actually not even American. They would come from Canada, Europe, all over the world, Australia. Teams would fly into Ensenada, Mexico, and we would take them through an experience where we would build a house for a homeless family in two days. It's not a house like in America. It's a 16 by 20 foot hut. But in Mexico, in the colonias where we were building these, it's the nicest house on the street. And so I went back down there and I leaned back into servitude. Remember yeah. before yeah. I learned through my healing that serving at the church was a huge part of where yeah. I was getting healed. Well, a few things happened and I had some more loss that we won't yeah. even talk about on this podcast. And so I just needed to get away. And I moved, like I said, to Mexico and started serving again. And once again, I'll just jump to the end of that story. Yeah. I got the most healing out of everybody. I'm down there building houses for homeless families. 
I end up starting an orphanage while I'm down there that I still have to this mm. day. Uh, so in 2010, I was asked because I was wow. a builder. I, I knew how to build stuff. I was building houses. I was asked to go to this ministry and build a stage so that they could do church on Sundays. And while I was there, I learned that there was a ministry for women who were at addict recoveries. They, they were they were recovering from an addiction to alcohol or drugs or whatever it was. And that's yeah. what this ministry ran there. But a lot of these women yeah. were moms and the dads are long gone. So they had kids that would just like kind of wait for mom to go through this program. Imagine it's mm. Mexico. There's no daycare. There's no family. These young moms go to get rehab and their kids Nothing. just kind of play in the dirt for 30 days while they're waiting for mom to go through this program. So I said, hey, what if we started an orphanage yeah. and had kids here who are waiting to be adopted and then the kids who are waiting for mom to get healthy can live at the orphanage and we can foster them. So we'll have two kids, foster kids and orphans. Long story short, uh, I, I raised a little mm -hmm. bit of money and we made it happen. We, we bought the land, we built a building and we started an orphanage in 2011. Fast forward to today, I still have that orphanage. You can go and see all about it on makemoneymatter.org. That's my nonprofit. We've turned it into a 501c3 organization. And who I we target, and I know this will resonate with you, Eric, is yeah. uh, we target any child in need, but we are in a border town. And leaving the politics out of it, as of recording this podcast, our southern border is wide open. You can literally walk from Mexico into America and not even encounter in encounter law enforcement and just start living your life here in America. And it is a huge, huge uh, epidemic wow. that we have at our border right now, because if you actually look into it, there are so much crime and so much stuff happening to these people who are just trying to get a better life. It's not good for them. It's not like they're casually walking across. I'll, I'll move on. What, it, what the cartels have learned, and this is one of the most yeah. horrible things happening on our earth today. But the drug cartels have learned that they can sell cocaine mm -hmm. once a day, but they can sell a 10-year-old girl 10 times a day. So the cartels have moved into human trafficking. And because the borders mm -hmm. are wide open right now, they're literally stealing children off the streets, both orphaned and children who have families. They are stealing children, trafficking them into America, where Western men with sexual appetites that need to go into wood chippers, as Andy Frisella says, do whatever they want to do to these 10, 12, 14 year old little girls. Yes. Yeah. So our orphanage now, instead of like Operation Underground yeah. Railroad, who are going to the to the children who have been human trafficked and stealing them out, we're doing the prevention and we're taking them off the streets and putting a roof over their head. So we're on the front end of children who are high risk for human trafficking. We are wow. adopting them into our orphanage and then getting They're them vulnerable. adopted into a family to keep them out of the sex trade. And it's sadly so wow. the need is so big that we're in the process of buying an additional five acres where we're going to build an entire city of of these little casitas. And we're going to be able to care for over 100 kids at a time. We hover between 25 and 30 kids at any given uh, time right now with the size of my current orphanage. But with the new land we're buying, we're going to plant them an orchard. We're going to build them a soccer field. And we're going to build 60 of these huts where we can have over 100 children <laughs> living with us That's safely, amazing. staying away from the cartels and being placed with families who love them. And so back to the question, you know, 2008, my business mm -hmm. started suffering. 2010, I threw in the towel. The girlfriend dumped me, which, by the way, that girlfriend that dumped me, I eventually asked her to marry me and got her back. She's my wife now. We are very happily married and have three beautiful children. Thank you very much. So I got her back. But at the time, the girlfriend dumped me. The business sucks. So I moved to Mexico on a whim. And here's that theme again coming up. I'm just there to serve. Wow. I'm running from my business. I'm running serve. from the ex-girlfriend. I'm running from serve. the trauma that I was still dealing with of losing Steve and Matt and plus some other loss that I'd had, again, that we didn't cover. And I go down there and I leave the, the, with the biggest reward. Uh, I, I helped countless families with homes. Uh, we, we ministered to the people of Mexico, the poorest people of Mexico, for the entire time that I lived there, which I lived in Mexico for the next seven months. Um, and, and it just, again, it, it completely changed my life. And I still, like I said, have that orphanage today. And it's one of the ways, it's part of my mission that, that I give back. And so outside of the business, my philanthropic endeavors is all around protecting and avoiding little kids being sucked into the sex trade. Yes. Well, let me just yeah. say, uh, this, 
is a man on a mission. Okay. Totally. <laughs> Incredible story. Yeah. Like this is exactly why we did this show. This is what we want to pull from people and inspire others to do the same because every single one of you can go be a hero today. You just have to start making decisions, not be a victim anymore. I think it really starts with that. And then you got to get your mindset into a place where every day you get some endorphins yeah. going and you figure out how to go fucking serve someone. And, and you know, and, and the rest will sort itself out. I mean, I obviously cold. Uh, we just, a fucking cold I mean, story. we just, uh, we just wrapped an episode, a conversation about, here's how we open it, Cole. Uh, there was a reel we saw about a child predator and what does he do to target a kid? He, he gauges whether the father is a threat or not. And it could be a present father, but he's distracted. He's depraved. Yeah, that's what a rapist and, said that, that he looks for is the characteristics of his victims. It really wasn't the child that he was interested in. What, ma what helped that person make their decision was, was there a father present? And, and if there was, what was the, was the father a threat? I mean, just let that sink in as we attack masculinity yeah, and, in America. And the, and the whole thing of the show is like, uh, it's just so moving to finish that conversation and be talking to you because yeah. the whole tenor of the show was how innocence is so vulnerable and kids have such faith and trust in whomever they're around and what in the hell are we going to do about it? So Eric and I kind of left it open ended. I mean, and it's so cool to meet a man. So with your orphanage, do the women, when they get yep. recovery, do they get to have the children back or are you, are you, yeah. Talk to us a little bit about that process and what, and what do you look for in terms of the security, stability, safety of the family when they get to go back to mom? It's important for us to have biological children be with their mother. And these moms are oftentimes uh, abused. Um, oftentimes they turn to drug and alcohol to self-medicate in the same way that I was, but for different reasons. And it's just this beautiful Christian based recovery program that they go through. I have nothing to do with that part of it. I'm, I only help with the orphanage. I have nothing to do with, with the women's program. Um, but to your point, we, we don't yeah. interfere with that. Uh, we would never take a, a mom's child away from her, uh, unless there are serious signs of abuse, but like we wouldn't even take that mom to begin with like the, the candidates that come into the recovery okay. program are vetted and we help women who want to be helped. And even if they're not the best moms, so much of the recovery yeah. program are parenting classes that we make sure that the mom is there long enough before we reunite them with their kid, which they still see their kid daily. Um, so, so just to be clear, the kid stays at the orphanage because we have oh, dormitories with bunk beds and they get to live with the orphan kids and play in our playground and go to school. I pay for all the kids to go to school. Um, because there is no public school system down in Mexico. It's all private wow. because they can't afford, there is no public system. So we pay for that. Um, and all their little uniforms and all of that stuff. Hmm. But, uh, so back to your question, uh, the, the moms are reunited with hmm. their kids when they've successfully completed the program. And then they go back to live productive lives. They are taught yeah. not just about God and, and healing, but they're, they're taught skills Wonderful. in this program too. Uh, we teach them English as best we can, because in Mexico, if you speak English, your career opportunities are like 10 X, especially in border towns to America, where all of these Americans yeah. speak English. And so they can get jobs at hotels or restaurants that they otherwise couldn't if they only spoke Spanish. So we pour so much into these moms that the kids are better off with their yeah. mom. Um, and then the, the other kids that are the adopted kids, what's really sad. And, and I can understand where, where adopting parents come from, but, I don't want to say all the time, but the majority of the time parents that want to adopt want very young children because they want kids are like the day they're born or like right. under two because they want that to be their child. And I can, I can understand that it's, it's harder for people to get adopted children that are like eight or older. Uh, and, and those are the, the rarest adoptions, but those mm -hmm. are the most common kids that are being targeted for human trafficking because those little girls' bodies have developed to a place where these disgusting men can molest them or do whatever it is that they want to do to them. So it's but. it's a catch. It's not a catch twenty two. It's it's a yeah. double edged sword where we're we're specifically looking for kids that are harder to adopt because those are the ones that are the greatest at risk for being sold, and so into slavery. And so um, yeah, it's, they're the most it's, vulnerable. I don't interfere yeah. with the process. I trust the process. My role for that orphanage is to make sure that nobody goes hungry and that it always has its funding. 
But but to your point, there have been some real challenges over the 10 years I've had this orphanage now of, um, or I guess 11 years now, that there are certain moms that come into the program where we have to ask ourselves, is this kid best off being with this mom? But we're not social services. Like we have no authority yeah. to be separating families. So we just do our best yeah. to yeah. equip these sure. moms to be the best moms they possibly can be. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say man on a mission, as you speak and you laying out all this infrastructure of your life, one of the things I admire about you and I know about you already, but it, it's really in line with this, is your ability to speak truth regardless of what consequences may exist. We sort of touched on this for a hot second, but I want to just really expand on, on the importance. There's so many people out there that are not saying anything. They're turning their cheek and they're looking the other way. And uh, this stuff's happening in front of us everywhere. And it, it really, it's amazing how bold it's become, especially in the last five years. COVID did something unique to America. I don't know, really, it's hard to put a finger on it, but it, it, it sort of progressed so much faster. The compounding nature of, 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 of how society's changed in the last five years is very, it's sad, it, it, but it's interesting. Like, how the fuck did this happen? And why, is, why are so many people not standing up and saying something because there should be a fucking roar in America right now. The lions should be coming up left and right and just ripping right now. We should be standing up and just, and really fucking rising as, as a culture here in America. It says no to this shit. Predators should be so afraid of fucking around with these children that they're just, they won't come out of their caves. But it just seems like, I don't know, man, maybe you can elaborate a little more on this, but it seems like pop culture and all these institutions and schools and higher learning. And I mean, Harvard and Stanford and Yale, you know, it's like, what the fuck is going on? What, what is happening right now? Yeah, we're at a really interesting time in American history and world history. And um, I think what you were just saying a second ago, we should be mm. roaring like lions. I, I, I think there's a lot of how do I say this? There's there's a lot of really questionable things that have happened because of COVID. Um, in, I mean, we can go yeah. from politics to the schools, um, the all of the videos I've seen of parents fighting back the school closures and all this stuff. It's been crazy, and we do need people to stand yeah. up and have voices for the voiceless, like these children who are being trafficked. And I think that the only reason more people aren't speaking up is cowardice. Because they, they are afraid of being polarizing or talking about subjects that are somewhat taboo or uncomfortable. It's way easier to talk about, you know, prosperity and working hard and making money and, and giving back. It's way harder to talk about real yeah. systemic problems that we have with victims of like children specifically, yeah. right? I mean, we can talk about so much with so what true. you're talking about with the school system and, and how they are indoctrinating our children to be anti-American, in my opinion. Why are they doing And it? just th like, there's, there's so much to talk about with what you just yeah. said, but, but being a person about solutions and not problems, the solution is there needs to be more people like you two creating podcasts where we can have honest conversations about these things, because I don't know who came up with the term a silent majority. Uh, a majority to me says that it's both sides. And there are a lot of polls with some of the things that are happening in our country right now, where both Democrats and Republicans are in agreement that they're unhappy with the way things are happening. But there's no one who's taking the stand, who's leading the groups, who wants to be the voice. And I think though, and I've been encouraged probably the last six months that I feel like m enough people like yourselves are getting irritated that they're starting to speak up about it. And I think, I think the worst thing people can do is say, Man, we're here. Uh, let's just stick with human trafficking. Human trafficking is one of the most horrible things, if not the most horrible things that people do to other people on earth. It bothers me. It's not fair. And I want to be a man that stands up against it. And they might say, well, what are my coworkers going to think if I talk about this on social media? Or what are my customers going to think? And you know what? Screw all of that. Because I want to be yes. a man that knows that I stood up for those. And I, ha I have a voice and I have a platform. And I want to use it for those who have no voice and have no platform. And I have worked. I have worked with women and children Respect. who are victims of sex trafficking. I went to Southeast Asia for seven weeks and worked in Thailand with a nonprofit organization called SHE, S-H-E. It's called Self-Help and Empowerment. And I literally worked with women and children who had been pulled out of sex slavery, who are now being rehabilitated through therapy and through 
uh, learning a skill to then go out and get a job. And it was really hard to, to do my work as a man because they had been so abused by men. But like I have looked in the eyes of women who had been sold 10 times a day and I've broken bread with them. And I've, and I've been in this ministry, like I said, for seven weeks with them. I know how horrible human trafficking is. I went to Phuket in Thailand and I walked through where the brothels are with this team. We were a prayer team. We were just walking down the street praying and you would see women who are being sold right on the street, mm. like literally right on the street. I've seen it. It pisses me off. And for anybody who's afraid to talk about these things because they're afraid how it will reflect on their brand, the only thing that the reflection of your brand will be is that you are someone with integrity who cares about fighting for what's wrong and speaking up for what's right on earth. So, so uh, you know, I agree with you. We yeah. should be lions. We should be talking mm -hmm. about it more. And people should stop being afraid of having hard conversations because it's having these hard conversations as a society that starts to change things. I have a question for Cole. What, what you bring to mind Cole in terms of people being afraid to like call this out is you can't participate in the depravity and stand against it. So what I mean by that is like with the advent of pornography out there, take it out of a religious lens the whole mechanism that energizes this depravity and has men uh, doing these dark things. I even think, it, how would I put this? The kind of man you are in your personal, private, quiet life impacts this. Like if you avoid pornography yourself and you elevate everything that's beautiful in your own private family with for your children and and support goodness it makes a real difference and uh, i don't want to get all bible thumping religious on this, yeah, on bottom this line, angle nobody's ser most people aren't serving anybody like just no one's serving anybody because the second you start serving and you get into the trenches even a little bit whatever little bad habits you have you probably are going to reconsider those you you just start inching closer towards the light yep. but if you don't serve it's so much harder to inch towards the light because you're so always sucked down these dark pathways of bad habits and cycles and chasing your own tail and never getting out of your own way and always being a victim. It's always people that are victims that are having all these fucking problems. The people that are out there serving, the people that are really winning in life, they're, they're putting others first and the universe fucking rewards them. So at the end of the day, like, what can you take from this? Okay. What? It's hard. Like, what is someone really going to take from this? Yeah. They listen. What are they going to go do with it? Yeah. Like, just take this. If you want to fucking win in life, you need to get it straight right now in your head. You're going to have to be a servant to something bigger than yourself to a movement, to a, to a cause, to God, to something. Yeah. You are going to have to stop being so fucking arrogant, so narcissistic, and thinking the world revolves around you, that we should all change the way we communicate because of you. That's not how it works. Yeah. We are, we are going to base this shit in truth and reality. Wherever the truth is, is where we work. That is the barometer for how we make decisions. And if I'm wrong, fine, show me the truth. Let's talk about it. But I'm willing to go there and I'm willing to talk about it. And if I'm wrong, I'll, ch I'll admit it. I'll lay down, I'll apologize, I'll say I'm sorry and I'll fucking and, own and it. I'll just add, and be the thing, man. Like that's what it, just to, just to add like fire to, to Eric's key thought. It's like, be the thing you stand for because it comes through. Like Cole, I don't know a lot about you personally, but it just shines through that you are at the very least a man who aspires to be these things in your private life because otherwise your words wouldn't, I wouldn't feel them hit my heart. Right? So I just want to say that point. You don't only have to get on a, get on a microphone stand and, but be it in your private life. Yeah. Either way, if you, someone should get fired up by this that is wanting more out of life because so many people make it about money, they make it about business, they make it about this, and they're missing a really crucial element to like real transformational success. And like Cole's tapped right into it in such a beautiful way. Like what a way to live life. I mean, this is, you know how free he is? You know, you know, you know how many people out there are always looking over their shoulder? They're always doing things and they're, and they're shady. They look in the dark, yeah. bro. Like you like really or to me are an expression of what yeah. it looks like to walk in the light. And so like, let's the winds, like I, I know we're up against the clock a little bit here, but like, I want to sort of love on you a little bit and really like, just like bow down What's that? a lot of respect, but we know you've been winning brother. We know that you've built a, a, a massive footprint and something that is really powerful. And I know there's a lot of people out there 
that are always trying to get to this point. Like, hey, how, how do you get rich? How do you get money? How do you get financial freedom? Like, we talked a lot about servitude and, and you know, that we touched on the gym. But, you know, entrepreneurship in and of itself is such a fucking gift because, like, it, it requires you to burn a bridge and to really commit, commit and go all in. And that's something most people don't do. They don't want to get out of their comfort bubble. They stay in this little bubble and they may push up against the, the, the you know, the, the edge a little bit here and there. But they quickly retreat. You know, the second something gets too uncomfortable, they retreat. Like, you really have to be able to take on something that I just think is not for everyone, for sure. But if this is also part of the game. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and so remember, my commitment to Steve and Matt was that I would live a life big enough for the three of us. And so being a missionary um, and going down to Mexico and starting that orphanage was all part of that promise and that commitment that I made to those two but I ended up running out of money. Uh, remember, I went down there with about 30 grand and I was living off of it for seven months. Once I started my orphanage, uh, I got it up to about 11 kids in that season. I was completely supporting the orphanage. So that 30 grand went away pretty quickly. And I realized that I needed to get financial support. So my first thought was, I'm gonna create a 501c3, find gentlemen like yourselves and try to convince you to donate to me every single month to support my ministry. But having already had been an entrepreneur, remember, I was crushing it 2005 through eight. I, I experienced what having, you know, I, I, I call it wealth. I was making maybe a half million dollars a year, but I was a 20 something year old. So I was like, I was, I felt rich at the time, at least. Yeah. Um, and so, so just That's coming back to America and starting a nonprofit where I was going to ask for donations didn't feel right. At the time, this was 2010, 11, Tom's shoes was blowing up. You guys heard of Tom's shoes? And they had this model for every pair of mm. shoes they sold, oh, yeah. they gave yes. a pair away. And I fell in love with that business model. And I was like, this is brilliant. This guy, Blake Mikowski, the founder of Tom's, he didn't start a nonprofit. This guy is worth $350 million. He's super successful. He started a for-profit business, but in the business model, it gives back. It doesn't just make him rich and then he's a philanthropist because that's what most people do is they they make yeah. money and then out yeah. of their earnings, they donate to the cause or charity or their church, whatever it is that they want to support. But what Tom's did was the business for every pair of shoes yeah. it sold, it gave a pair away. That's in the business model. Then after it does that, then it pays Blake, the founder, his salary where he can go off to be as generous as he wants. So that was the distinction that I liked about it was this isn't just a rich philanthropist. This is a business that in the model of the business itself is solving a social problem. It's giving shoes to kids in third world countries that don't have any. And I said, yeah, that's what cool. I'm going to do instead. Instead of going back to America and starting a nonprofit and asking people to just donate to me, I'm going to go back to America and start one of these businesses that makes me money, but gives back to my orphanage so I can go and run a business again and fund my orphanage. Well, fast forward, I've then decided to call that business a yes, for-purpose so awesome. business model. I came back to America. I restarted my real estate business. It's now 2011. I did my first deal in August of 2011. I moved back from Mexico in March. So it took me about five months to get my first deal. And then what's really cool is God blessed my business. And we went off to make tens of millions of dollars in my entrepreneurial career. I've been a real estate investor, and that's where the majority of my net worth and money came from. Yeah but I've made millions of dollars as a professional speaker. I own 23 fast casual restaurants right now that I've been an investor in. Um, a bunch of diff different ventures that I'm an investor in. We won't like tech and things like that. Who cares that pay me nice dividends? But my business is cranking to your point. And what what is the catalyst that changed everything for me was all of my businesses are now for purpose organizations where they don't just make me millions of dollars, but they solve mm, some sort of a social purpose. need or cause. Many of them give back to my own charity, my own nonprofit, because my charity is a 100% pass through um, nonprofit. What that means is I personally fund everything. And for those that do donate to my charity, 100% goes to my kids because I'm not drawing a salary. We don't have an office. We don't have staff. We don't have overhead. And so a lot of my for profit or for purpose businesses support my own children and the expansion. It's not cheap buying five acres down there and all the stuff that we're doing. And so, you know, for the listeners that, that, wants to do one of two things, either A, fall back in love with your business or B, start a business that will literally like fill your soul and not just your bank account. I encourage people to try the four yeah. purpose business Amen. model. And it's as easy as three steps. Number one, figure out what it is that you're passionate about that you want to make a difference in the world. For mm -hmm. me, it's children, it's human trafficking or, or the, the ending of human trafficking, I should say. Um, and the elderly, I've got a soft spot for the elderly too. Yeah. Uh, there are other problems on earth like 
animals and and um you know the pollution yeah. and all that stuff as much Cancer. as it bothers me it's not what i want to yeah. live my life fighting for i want to fight for kids and so number one step first step is find the thing that you're passionate about number two is find an organization that you have vetted and trust that is fighting for that cause and then number three is evaluate your own business model and your own economic model and figure out how you can modify your price points to be able to give something towards that it doesn't have to be huge uh, Bedros Koulian, who's a, who's a friend of mine and who should definitely be on this podcast if he hasn't already been. Uh, he's a man on a mission for sure. Uh, when he heard this, uh, he and I spent mm-hmm. a day together. He gave I me a Bedros. VIP day and I ended up teaching him how to go for a purpose. He had a subscription thing that was $47 a month. Oh, All wow. he did was change it to $50 a month. He only added three dollars so that his consumers of that product hardly yeah. felt it. But there's enough of them, and that three dollars has been multiplied enough times that he's given over seven figures to Cedar Cyanide Hospital, I believe is the hospital that he believes in, where he's donating wow. to. So so to go for purpose doesn't mean that you take your Amazing. existing business wow. and just start writing checks because you might not be in the financial position in your business to right now today afford to do so. It's a matter of getting creative. What Tom's did right. to be able to afford that pair of shoes that they gave away is they baked the cost of that second pair of shoes into the original pair. So Tom's knew their metrics and they sure. knew what they yeah. needed to make on each pair of shoes. They knew what their cost was for the shoes that they gave away. So they just added that on the top. So to become a for purpose business doesn't mean that you're going broke and working for nothing. There are actual statistical facts that show that by coming for a purpose, you actually gain larger market share because consumers migrate to your business because they want to be a part of this philanthropic consumerism. And so I'm glad we had time to come to this because my biggest mission, bro, beyond even my own orphanage, yeah, like the mission yeah. that I am a man on that, that, that God had put on my heart is I want to completely change commerce. And I want to have the four mm. purpose conversation on enough podcasts and enough stages that enough businesses change that this is just the way that consumers expect commerce to happen. And if you are a business owner that only makes profit for yourself, Fantastic. you will lose so many customers and so much market share because your direct competitors for a purpose and your customers want to go and do business with them instead yes. that you have Love to make it. a choice as a business owner to either go for a purpose or go out of business altogether. So I will spend the rest of my life having this conversation. There are so thousands powerful. of for purpose businesses now that are changing millions of lives Tens of millions of dollars have been raised for charity because of these conversations. And I will not stop until it's just the way that business is done. There are now two questions that you ask people. You don't just say, yo, what do you do, bro? Yeah, you say, it. what do you do and what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your charity you're fighting for? Because it's just the way that business yes. is done. Yeah, what's your so purpose? that is my number one I mission. And I've started an annual event called Thrive, yeah. where we bring in thousands of business owners to teach people how to do this. And through my mastermind, which I mean, I'm not even here to promote that. It doesn't matter. I'm just fighting on this war path of trying to get as many businesses to run like Tom's shoes as possible. And it's happening, bro. And I know that it's, it's gaining momentum. And at some point, the right influencer is going to talk about it or the right moment, the right podcast. Maybe it's today. Maybe it's this moment right now. We'll get happen and where it will go viral and all businesses will be for purpose. And then we don't even need nonprofits anymore because I love nonprofits. I own one, but they're stupid because they have no revenue. They 100% depend on other people's charitable yeah. contributions to exist. Yeah. They're fighting noble, worthy causes, but they can't even afford to keep their lights on 99% of the time. So what if the business owners just stepped up and solved those social needs and problems in our earth where we don't even need nonprofits anymore totally agree. because the businesses that have all the yeah. influence, all the resources and all the money are just solving the problems. That is the mission I'm on and a, sh- a shameless plug yeah. for Amen. anybody that wants more content. I did a TED. I did a no, TEDx talk on this. Please. You can just Google Cole Hatter TEDx and you'll see 18 minutes of me explaining exactly yes. how to run a for purpose business. But that's my mission, bro. I'm watching it. Yeah, that is so amazing. So fantastic. I, I, I tend to really agree with you, too. I think a lot of charities and I'm on the board of a few, of, and, and, but they're run like bureaucracies. Very often they're not run by entrepreneurs and they're super inefficient. The for purpose model, something I have adopted, make a wish is sort yeah. of like our, our mechanism, if you will. Um, but I really love the whole concept. We do it uh, something for uh, for police dogs, which is a really cool thing. We do it at, at one of our stores in Nevada. But we, we really have adopted this whole concept of bringing charity inside the business. But I like that you have your own organization that you could feed through your own businesses. But no, it's great. I love this. Uh, so good. For purpose business. So if we send- Man on a mission. Yeah. 
Um, you said make a money, awesome. make money matter.org. Is that, where's the best place if people wanted to go donate or, 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 or dig into your yeah, causes? Yeah. So that would be, if anybody's compelled to donate again, I'll remind you 100% of your donations just goes into a checking account that just goes to pay for these children's food and schools and medical supplies and things like that. I don't take a fraction of one cent. We'll make a donation today, oh, brother. That's, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you. But so it's makemoneymatter.org um, is that website. And then if you want to follow me, it's just at Cole Hatter on all social handles, Instagram, Facebook, you name it. And so, you know, if you've got any questions on this, shoot me a DM. I, I try my best to be pretty responsive in my DMs. I check them out once or twice a day. So you can find me at Cole Hatter. If you want to learn more about the cause, it's makemoneymatter.org. Um, and yeah, I'm just, again, I've, I hope to have a lot of life ahead of me because I've got to live enough for three of us, like I said, and hopefully making millions of dollars, running the nonprofit, uh, giving back and having this for purpose conversation will be enough that hopefully when I do get to see Steve and Matt again, I can say literally tens of millions of businesses have become <laughs> for purpose. Mm. Trillions of dollars have been donated to ch charity and hundreds of millions of lives have been changed. And then I'll, and then I'll be able to look at Stephen Matt in the face and say, I, I, I did what I promised you I would do. I love it, man. You're an inspiring human. I love you, brother. Yeah, You're absolutely. incredible. Thank you so much. So inspiring. Yeah. You got, you got two angels with you right now, man. They're holding, they're guiding you and holding, holding your hand through this process, God bro. Bless. You, Thanks, you inspire bro. the fuck out of me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cole. Yeah. Fuck. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a man on a mission. I'm a man on a mission.